Welcome to the one of the last sessions of the evening. Don't forget the de design slam after this, but um, I'm glad you could all join us. My name is Margaret Late. I'm an associate professor of architecture here at PSU, and I'm a fellow at the Center for Public Interest Design. Um, I'm currently working, the reason I'm kind of here is I'm currently working with the Institute for Sustainable Solutions here. We're trying to package together a kind of an all-in-one ADU package that includes some creative financing, some, uh, a number of designs for, um, so pre-designs for ADUs, as well as a kind of concierge service um, that we're working with uh, Inhabit, a uh, nonprofit to, to help us put together for homeowners who are struggling to stay in their home. So um, I'm excited to have uh, what we're calling the uh, mo most prolific builders of ADUs in North America. I don't know, is that hyperbole? <laughs> Probably, probably not. Take it. Yeah, take it. Um, and I'm sure uh, a lot of you also are excited to hear basically uh, how you guys do it, how you create a niche for yourself and how you have been able to kind of scale up uh, in terms of efficiency and constructability in the small home market. So thanks for being here. I'm going to say a little bit about the, uh, our speakers today. Um, Joe Robertson. Uh, at the far end there, is the owner and operator of Shelter Solutions LLC, a home builder in Portland metro area, specializing in accessory dwellings. Joe has been a builder since graduating for, from Virginia Tech with a degree in building construction in 1976. He's a certified master builder in the state of Oregon, certified aging in place contractor, and a certified green professional. Over his 41 years in the building business, Joe has completed hundreds of high-end custom homes, move up and entry level homes and numerous entire subdivisions including all the site development. In 1998 with changes in the Portland zoning code he pioneered building accessory dwellings in the Portland metro area. Since that time he and his company have completed over 100 ADUs in, Port in Portland. Um, on this end here is Jake Fry. He started Small Works uh, in late 2005 became a strong advocate for the introduction of laneway housing Vancouver, Canada, <laughs> um, and worked with the city of Vancouver and other municipalities to help develop zoning bylaws based on experience, his experience and interaction with literally hundreds of potential small home clients. Jake not only wanted to build small but to build sustainable. He brings together a team of dedicated people and develops homes which blend innovative techniques and incorporate modern building science and flat pack with hard built finishes and millwork. In 2014, he was named the Ernst & Young's Entrepreneur of the Year in Manufacturing. Today he focuses on finding new ways to broaden the range of housing types in Vancouver to create affordable options for single family home ownership. And in the middle is Kevin Casey. He's the founder and CEO of New Avenue. New Avenue is an architecture, construction, and project management company focused on expanding traditional homes beyond single family use. Over 20,000 owners have hired 1,500 vetted architects and builders on New Avenue. This represents over $100 million in custom residential projects that are managed on the New Avenue platform. Projects include custom designed new homes, additions, remodels, and accessory dwelling units that range from 100,000 to over 2.5 million. Casey obtained an MBA from the Haas School of Business at UC Berkeley and a BA in Economics and Anthropology from Fordham University and studied community development as a Fulbright Scholar. So welcome gentlemen, and I'm going to go ahead and start, uh, if we could, with Joe. Thank you. Can everybody hear me okay back there? Uh, just real briefly so I can get an idea of the audience I'm speaking to and be able to shape my discussion. Uh, Get, just get a quick show of hands. How many people here are builders? Yeah, good. At least half. How many of those from out of the area here? Okay. Uh, designers? Okay. And then other people uh, seeking uh, to build ADUs or alternative housing? Okay, good. Well, good mix. All the above, it looks like. Um, so, as she, as she mentioned, I'm been a builder for a long time, but I've been started in custom home building, and then throughout the years, uh, when I moved to Portland, actually I started uh, with a company here and stayed with them for quite a while in what I'd consider production home building. We did our own subdivisions and uh, uh, built all of our homes, both pre-sale and speculative. And in 98, I saw where the planning code was changing 
to allow, uh, be friendlier, so to speak, to ADUs in the city of Portland. No one knew what they were at that time. I thought, wow, that's a cool little deal, cool potential niche market and so forth. And uh, throughout the years, I kept building conventional building, but I did one or two ADUs a year. And uh, it just kept growing and growing until about 2010, I just made the decision to go that way all the way. And I quit buying land and quit trying to develop and doing the conventional b builder development thing. Thank you. Okay. Uh, there we go. And this, uh, this little presentation here is meant for a longer period of time, so I'm going to be whizzing through it really quick. So what this is kind of geared to is to, everybody know, here understands what ADUs are. I don't need to do a, uh, an ADU introduction. What I'm going to address more is what are some of the challenges and opportunities in building ADUs differently or a different twist than from building conventional homes. So I combined my experience with custom home building and my experience with production home building and used the production home building part for organizational skills, scheduling, management, and the custom home building with each one of these is a little custom home uh, as far as the intricacies of them, but also from the standpoint of customer relationship, communication with customers, and so forth. So I'm a, kind of a hybrid of those two things. Um, opportunities, as you can see, they're developing in other cities, and I, I can't speak to those directly. But here in Portland, it's at this point in time almost an endless opportunity because they're you can build an ADU on any residential lot within the city of Portland. And the outer lying areas, each municipality has a, a program for accessory dwelling units. Um, they can be detached, attached, um, garage conversions, garage tear down and rebuilds. And here's just some examples of a, a few that we've done. These are all attached units. These are uh, basements that have been converted to uh, ADUs, they're, uh, they're challenging. And I heard just the tail end of this last uh, spe uh, session here, and they were talking about carve-outs uh, being more economical. And that's possible, but I have found that uh, converting basements is not as economical as most people would just assume because you've already got the structure there. There's a lot of reworking to do in, in creating a, a an ADU in a basement, um, separating the utilities for one, fire ratings between the dwelling units and so forth, uh, can get pretty expensive. And it's, I've had a few that were right up there with building the same size structure um, detached. So, but there, there's opportunities there. Um, we're doing a lot here in Portland with garage replacements. Uh, all the older neighborhoods here uh, most of the houses have a detached garage. It's back, back in the back corner of the lot that's just fallen apart. It's unusable, won't fit a car. Um, and uh, we, we do uh, uh, tear those down, recycle everything we can, and then replace it with either a new garage with an ADU above it or just a freestanding ADU like this one here. These are also just all garage replacements. And this has become very popular lately, is our garage conversions. Now those older ones that I was uh, referring to where we tear them down and recycle and rebuild, uh, you, can't, you can't convert those because of the structure itself, the foundation wasn't built correctly even at, in the year that it was built and so forth. Uh, but if you find some that, garages that are say from the 1940s on, definitely from the 50s on, they're quite often uh, structurally sound enough to be able to convert to an ADU. And so basically what we do is rebuild it from the inside out. Um, and that's become very popular. It's just a select number of garages here that are suitable for that. So the challenges here, and the, uh, the following slides will elaborate on these challenges a little bit. Uh, but building in Portland, and a lot of got people here from other areas, our typical lot is 50 by 100, uh, city uh, residential lot. Um, primarily what I do are detached ADUs, so they're typically in the backyard unless it's a corner lot. 
So access is always an issue. And uh, I'll show you some examples later. Uh, here in Portland, uh, very sensitive about trees. Tree protection is uh, uh, a very big issue. And how much area you can disturb around a tree that's bigger than 12 inch diameter and so forth. Um, working in the neighborhoods, both with neighborhood neighbors, deliveries, uh, parking, all a big challenge. Um, and then utility connections. Um, I'll just stop there for a second. Like I said, I've been building residential homes for years, and I really feel strongly that building a little six, eight hundred square foot ADU in someone's backyard is much harder than going out and building a 2,500 square foot house on a vacant lot in a subdivision. There's a lot more to it, plus you have everything that big house has in a little house, and uh, then you have these other challenges like utility connections and how you're going to connect the sewer and you're going to get fall and all the, uh, the logistics with that and water and power. Um, the customers are living on site most of the time, so then it's almost like remodeling from, a, from that standpoint in that you're interacting with them every day if you're a builder. Um, and cost. People think a smaller house ought to cost a lot less. Not the case in that you still got a kitchen and you still got a bathroom, the permit costs and the site improvement costs, and a smaller square footage. So uh, I end up actually paying my subcontractors uh, more than they would be working on a conventional home. Number one, to get them to work for me, and number two, it's more specialized and uh, it's slower for them. Uh, working through the process of municipality permits, I won't get into that because it's going to vary with everybody here. There's some examples. That's a typical Portland street on the left there. Uh, typically, we, sometimes we have to get street closures where we buy no parking signs for a period of time just to be able to have a spot for delivery trucks and subcontractors. Uh, access, the middle slide there, you can see the tracks in the dirt. We built an 800 square foot ADU in the backyard at everything came through that five foot spot right there between the house and the property line. That's not unusual. So that, that brings a whole different dynamic to, to building a structure. And then in Portland, there's a lot of shared driveways, which you have to work out with the neighbors and the neighborhood and so forth. Um, material staging, places to put, put the material. I have to get smaller deliveries and more frequently so we don't have big piles of materials and we have places to put them. So it <laughs> takes a lot more coordination. We love alleys. There are a lot of alleys in Portland and it's nice to have a, an ADU that backs up to an alley. Tree protection I mentioned. Uh, typically a tree that we have to protect for whatever uh, inches in diameter, say a 24 inch diameter dug fir, we've got to go out around it one foot for every inch. So we've got to go out around a 24 foot diameter with protection. So that, that's a whole other dynamic that we have to deal with. There's some, it's a lot more complicated than that. You can, you can encroach on that space a certain percentage and so forth, but it's something that we have to deal with almost now on every project. Isn't it radius? Uh, no, it's diameter. It's 24 feet out from the face of the tree. Yeah, if it's a 24 inch diameter, you've got to go out 24 foot diameter. From the tree? Yes. Out, so that's the radius, right? So it's half the diameter? Sorry. It's a diameter. Oh, Never mind. all the way around, yes. 24 feet. Right, yeah. Yes. Okay, I think we're saying the same thing. Never okay. Uh, and then uh, uh, utilities I mentioned before, uh, particularly sewer. Sewer's the biggest challenge, is how you're going to get the sewer hooked up. Lots of times we go in the basement of the house and we can hit the stack. Sometimes we have to hit it out in the front yard, so that makes a, another disturbed area that you have to deal with. Uh, sewer connections, I mentioned uh, there's two examples, one outside and one inside. Utility trenches for power and gas. Uh, electricity here, we have to be on, I heard another question in the previous uh, session about separate meters. You have to have, the ADU has to be on a separate electric meter from the house. You can't have them tied together. Uh, as far as that goes, you, here you can't have anyone in one house be able to control the utilities, the water or the power or the gas in the other unit. So they have to be separated and have separate controls. But the power company and the city uh, requires that they be on uh, separate electric meters. That's a challenge too and that you, 
this is the existing house, you have to end up redoing the whole service on the existing house and put a two gang meter and then go underground back to the ADU. Two gang. Question back there? Two <coughs> meter. Um, Again, I mentioned the, the customers living on site, communication is really key, and uh, keeping your workmen in check as far as your, they're visiting the, the people's property and uh, quite different than working on a, a separate house out in a subdivision. Uh, so the customers are involved 24-7, texting, emailing, talking directly to you on the site, and it's... Uh, it's a challenge, but it's, it's part of the job, and that's actually part of the job I really like. Um, or I like all of it, but that, that part I really enjoy. And I mentioned cost. I think I've covered these. The, the subcontractors um, charge more, basically, uh, the utilities and, and the duration of building. I won't really get into working with the city because uh, it's specific to our area here. And uh, these are just some examples. I don't know how I'm doing on time. I've got a few examples to show. How are we doing? How much? Four minutes. Oh, good. Okay. So these are just examples of some challenges. The one up the top left, you can see the ADU in the very back of that Tudor house. Did a garage with an ADU above it. On the right hand side, you can see I'm three feet off their swimming pool with the ADU, <laughs> which was really a challenge. Uh, and then down at the bottom left is the, the same one. It's a shared driveway with a neighbor. Um, that particular one with the swimming pool, for example, uh, you can't just dig a footing four feet deep right next to a sw full swimming pool or it'll just bust out. But in Oregon, at least, you can't just drain a swimming pool too because the groundwater will pop it up out of the ground. So I had to get some engineering and figure out how much we had to lower the water and all that stuff. And several sleepless nights on my part until they we got it poured and got the weight back on the foundation and got it back. Um, the other one there, uh, you're looking at the back end of the one on the right there, you're looking at the back end of the existing garage behind the house. We had to take the wall out and in that picture is a track hoe going in and out through that garage and the, <laughs> the gravel area where the guy is standing is where we built the ADU. So we brought everything through the existing garage to build the ADU, and then when we were done, we closed the garage back up. <laughs> and it had a breezeway that connected the two together. And then I'll just finish it off. These are just examples of finished ones that we've done. This one uh, across the river here in the Selwood area. This one in North Portland. Interesting story here, the guy, single guy, uh, built the ADU, moved in it, rents his house out for Airbnb, and basically lives rent mortgage free. <laughs> uh, pretty good success story. And he built a, we built a really nice ADU for him. Um, another one, Southeast Portland, an artist, and he lives in it, rents his house out also. Uh, this was uh, matching the existing house. In front of the car there, none of that existed. Well, actually, it was an old one-story garage there, and we rebuilt to match the existing house. This is in a neighborhood here in Portland that doesn't particularly like ADUs. And uh, <laughs> so if you do anything wrong or step out of the regulations, you're, you're toast. And uh, people were grump grump walking back and forth on the sidewalk, grumbling, and then when we started, and then at the end, they're like, can you come and look at my place? I'd like to do something. <laughs> and that's, that's really kind of common. It's, it's, it's our nature. We don't like change. So when they see change going on in their neighborhood, it, it looks bad to them at first. But usually when we're done, it blends right in with the neighborhood and they're, they're a lot more favorable about it. Uh, just a little one level. Is that it? Good, because I'm about the end here. <laughs> There we go. Thank you very much. Thanks, oh, okay, great. I think we got to set something up here. Oh, sorry. Yeah, something special here. Yeah, it have to be a little different. And, and on that note, I'm going to stand up. I found it easier to talk when I'm standing. Otherwise, I can't think. <laughs>
So Joe, you know, we have an off season in our logging up north, so we do have a, quite a few uh, logging helicopters you might consider yeah. using. <laughs> <laughs> so, I think so. I think there's a full. If I hit this one, in the top. In the top. Yep. One more time. And go back down to the box. What you just said. See, now we're going to find out who's really good at this. <laughs> and my colleague at the back knows what to do. Where, which one do we hit, Rob? Okay, now, and now here's, here comes the challenge for someone who works on a Mac, right? I'm trying to, there we go. Okay, this one. Oh my God, I made the trade test. Thank you. So thanks very much. So my name's Jake Fry. Uh, I did speak this morning. I have a company called Small Works, and we're from Vancouver, Canada. And I did check my passport at the border, so <laughs> everything's in order. Um, so here we go. So our firm is a uh, design-built firm. And we uh, basically take our clients from the beginning of a process. Uh, literally, we have a, quite, a, quite a dynamic sales uh, process that we have. And we take them right through, through construction. And so we're taking all, not only the design phase, but the liaison, liaisoning with the city. And also, uh, obviously, we manage a construction process. So we were the kind of pioneers, and I think I can, I can sort of unabashedly uh, say that in Vancouver. We promoted uh, our, what we call, your ADUs, we call laneway houses in our neck of the woods. And we promoted that for about six years prior to becoming a bylaw, and we're involved in writing the bylaw. And um, we built about 140 homes at this point. Uh, we have about 15 in construction, and we have another order for 46 uh, laneway homes. And uh, you know, we've done fairly well and won some awards, and, and we're very proud of the work that we've done. Um, interesting enough, so what I'd like to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about our company and then kind of broach into what I feel is sort of the overarching subject about, you know, what do we do as a community of builders and interested parties uh, to be able to look at what are these trends in, in North America? And as we move into this, how are we going to ramp up? What are we going to do to make supply? And this to give you a, a short uh, kind of, you know, localized issue that we're facing. Um, you know, right now we look at the numbers that we built, about 50% of what we built um, of these homes have been in the latter part of our company. So we're already in a decline. Now, we're just gone through a new zoning and kind of citywide planning. So we need to introduce 150,000 residential units in the next 10 years in our city. Uh, we're obviously advocating for our smaller ground oriented uh, build forms to be part of that. And we're looking at in, in our city, where again I mentioned this morning, our median house price is about two hundred, uh, sorry, two million dollars for a typical city lot in Vancouver. High end, generally over ten million. Uh, the lowest I've seen, I think I didn't look, but last week I looked. I think the lowest in the market was about one point five seven or something like that. Um, interesting. Eighty, about eighty-five percent of our land mass is single-family homes it comprises something less than 6% of our population. So, and we're locked in, we're locked in by rivers and mountains. And so we're really having to understand, and, and I, I won't go too far into this, but we're really having to understand what are we gonna do with our housing in Vancouver? But obviously this is, we're proponents of this housing. And what we're looking at is having to pretty much bring about 7,000 ADU units to 15,000 over the next 10 years. And we're gonna be part of that process and obviously we're not gonna build all of it, but these are lessons I think are, yes? Is that per year or is that total? Total per 10 years. Yeah, we're not 7,000 a year, that'd be a lot. Um, and, uh, but so this is some of the things that we're learning, we're sharing and we'd like to share them with you too because I think again, Vancouver is a little bit on the leading edge for a number of reasons. Not all of them are great because they're around housing problems and not being able to fulfill a really good solid community around housing because of a number of contributing factors. Um, so let's get on with it. So when we first started, we thought the solution and what we promoted was let's do fixed plants. We're going to have four or five models. They were really beautiful. We built a couple before there was even a bylaw. We had the Olympics just basically two months after this bylaw had passed. The city came to us and said, could you build us a finished home? And we had like two months to put it together. 
Uh, and we did it, and it was a lot of sleepless nights, but it was, it was great. And we had the idea we were going to do this, that this was going to be our way forward. And so one of the things that we had done um, was that we would be easy, this would be easy scalable. There would be not a lot of difficulty to be able to produce a lot of units. And we learned quite quickly this wasn't what people wanted. And, and it wasn't going to work. And we had actually had a whole bunch of pre-sales. We set up a factory. We had a whole closed wall system. We were producing in our own factory at about 14,000 square feet, plus a cabinet shop. Uh, we did a bunch of development work. We have and prototypes that we built. In fact, Robert, who's with me today, lives in our, one of our first homes. And we, have, we built a bathroom finished with porcelain tiles, a mechanical room, a really high-end kitchen. And we were able to produce it as one unit, bring that in and drop it in the site, and then build the house around it. But the market didn't want that. What the market wanted was this. Much higher end, much more luxurious homes that tended to have, I mean, we've even put homes with $10,000 ranges in them. Um, it's just what the market wants right now. Now, it's not addressing the need of what the city is, and it's not necessarily our first choice, but obviously that we have to react to the market. And as I would mentioned this morning, a lot of times they are at this level of finish because there is re they're residential owners. So they're people who are living in them, who are paying for them. This is their home. This is a retirement home. This is their starter home. And we, we need to respect that and, and, and not uh, focus on, let me see if I can switch that over. Well, anyway, so there's some, let me just go back for a sec, sorry. So, okay, this better shot. So there we can see the interior of the homes that we're, we're generally doing and and, and this became our strategy moving ahead, that we needed to react to this. Now, obviously, hand in glove with that is a bit of a challenge because how do you be able to produce large volumes of this type of housing? It's really problematic, right? Um, really difficult to scale. Um, each house is unique, each site is unique. And, I, and on the regulatory front, what we found too was a city Understandably, we're, we're your, your creative body and we know what it's like. We have a creative body and there's always going to be a natural talent, uh, cha uh, challenge and tension that comes with regulatory bodies. Often they may be wanting to get to the same end, but the process to get there can be challenging. And so what we were finding was that we would come back even when we did have duplicate plans and we would get different notes from different planners. So we ourselves were inhibited from doing what the city wanted us to do because this initially started as a rental program for affordable rental. Um, so I wanted to just take a second. So I'm going to just talk about our strategy and our curve. So we started off wanting to do standard plans. But, and we had invested a lot of money, both from pre-sales and I had capitalized to build a factory. And we had operated like that for about three or four years. We didn't build a lot of homes. We were ramping up at that point. Maybe we got to 40 homes or something by that point. But it was very difficult to support the factory without probably a run of more like 300 homes in front of us. Um, what, the product, fa what the factory could effectively produce wasn't what the market wanted, even though it was a high level of finish and it was high quality homes, the individuality became very problematic. So then at the same time, corresponding, we'd spent so much resources on the factory and the systems and we have really, we'd always set ourselves up to be a big company. Even though we're gonna be a small company, we have very, very, very rigorous processes. So we have a very detailed budget, great cost control, great cost accounting. We have applications so when our designers are working with our homeowners, they do work online and record that material online as we go so we can keep sort of a single entry system throughout the process. Um, and we're building systems, you know, creating manuals around our builders so we could trans, as, as crews moved, we were able to keep control of that. And, and we're still a tight group. At one point we had about 60 employees now we're down to 20 employees, but we have a tight, uh, probably about another cohort of subtrades at around 50 to 70 people that are in annual contracts. So we were able to kind of manage those and we created infrastructure to manage those. But our sales suffered because we were spending so much energy on that. So then Robert came on board. We have introduced a lovely uh, sales program. We're keeping, you know, uh, at our peak, we're keeping a steady flow of three new customers. We've now adjusted that. Uh, we can talk about that in a second. Then we had a really robust sales. And as you can see from our numbers, we, we go up. But then we're obviously, as any, and Joe could probably talk about this, or any builder here, once you start to ramp up, you have quality control. So what we've come to now at the conclusion of this is that we scale back a little bit in our production. We take certain, the key areas of the prefab that were really good, like panelization, found a good partner to work with. Uh, they took on some of our line. It's a trust factory, so they produce our panels. We're able to keep a much tighter building cycle with that, so we do our 
that kind of pile of lumber into the infrastructure that happens in a factory and comes in pieces, goes together. And then we've kept all those systems intact and we've used the best practices of all those to be able to produce really effectively. So looking ahead and maybe really at the core of what I, I hope we could talk about and if there's a Q&A we can get into this a little more detail. But basically what I want to look at is, you know, what I would project is the best opportunity we have looking ahead as a building community in North America focusing on smaller ground oriented housing is to really look into the current infrastructure of how we build residential properties, extract good partnerships and best practices to be able to and, and effectively kind of retool how we're approaching residential construction. And I think within that success and the success of establishing those type of partnerships, finding people who have you know, infrastructure and back-end components, and I think Kevin's going to be speaking to you a little bit of that, being able to then pull in best practices from the prefab. I mean, we have the most dynamic, effective prefab system in the world in North America, but they're building RVs primarily, and they do a really good job at that. So what can we extract from that process? And then what can we do to bring that and make things that are site specific. And I think it's that relationship with really and cre recreating that as a group and as we reach out individually within our communities, that is where we're going to have the real success story. And certainly that's what we're establishing in our practices in Vancouver as we look at this huge growth that we're going to have to look at in the next 10 years. Thank you. called New Avenue Homes um, nine years ago and uh, I'm going to talk a bit about well I mean the, the topic of this session is scaling up and, and we're really focused on scaling up accessory dwellings but as I said in my bio we've, we've we st I founded the company specifically to create accessory dwellings and we've morphed into lots of accessory dwellings with lots of other things uh, a little bit because we were driven by the market as Jake spoke to so I'm going to speak a bit about where I come from um, what we're doing at New Avenue and also the community that we're, the way we're working with our community. Um, my background really, family history goes back because I think it's relevant. In the 1880s, my great great grandparents had a cinder block factory in Buffalo, New York, which I like to think is prefabrication, you know, <laughs> early days. Um, then my grandfather, or great grandfather, didn't want to schlep cinder blocks around and moved into the furniture business which is, I kind of joke, was filling up the houses that the previous generation built. Uh, my grandfather did, again, modular stuff, modular airports for the Army Corps of Engineers. And then um, my father was an environmental engineer who focused a lot on freshwater and wastewater treatment. This is a photo of a passive wastewater treatment pond in a small town uh, south of Rochester, New York, which, if you've ever dealt with, if we think we deal with tough permitting stuff, 
wait until you see what happens when you put in a passive treatment pond in a union town that doesn't require any labor once you start using it. <laughs> that followed him for his career. Uh, the, my favorite thing, though, the, like, half the reason I really wanted to show these was, um, aside from being proud of the history, is this photo is my first job when I was about 15, uh, 25 years ago. That's my uncle, who's a small contractor in a suburb outside of Buffalo, New York. That's the first house I ever worked on. Uh, we built it together. Architects and contractors, you probably have already noticed, it's vinyl siding with some bricks slapped on the front. It is on a cul-de-sac. It is single family that's over 3,000 square feet. It's like everything that we don't talk about in this room. Don't we? <laughs> uh, that being said, here's some funny stuff. This photo is a, I don't have a photo of the house, so I grabbed it off Google Earth. He's like salvaging two two by fours out of uh, some other job that he's putting in his garage. And that's, you know, that's what I think comes back to it oftentimes with a lot of contractors or contracting in general is that level of discipline. Um, the, there are some good attributes of the house, I might have, many good attributes. There's no rug carpets throughout the whole thing. Indoor air quality was a thing. 25 years ago, they have wood floors throughout. So there are many aspects of this custom construction that, that I still admire. Um, this is what New Avenue has done. And I'll dig into these six projects on the next slide. Um, but in general, New Avenue, I started in 09, which was nine full years that we've been doing it. We've employed 1,500 designers and builders to build um, all of the projects that we have going on. And this year, we're signing up 70 million worth of new projects, which about 90% of them start as an accessory dwelling, and then half of them end up being truly an accessory dwelling. The other half morph into something else. Um, and. Uh, last thing, we have a task force in Berkeley. I just, I basically dropped in the slide. I'm going to talk about our ADU 360 task force a bit. Uh, so, regarding our six, the six project types, these are um, six New Avenue projects that we finished. This is why we focus exclusively on custom architecture and custom contracting, custom construction because this is what the market wants. And these are projects all over the country. I also think these, this is, frankly, how I view the world of housing. I think these are six project types that if you're really lucky, you'll go through all six. If you're lucky, you'll do one or two. Um, some people will do, will get involved in all six in their lifetime. Um, a new custom home, this is about 5,000 square feet, custom home in upstate New York, two hours from New York City. Interesting thing for this group, this third peak, this entire addition, was for the parents of the young, wealthy New York couple uh, to move into. It's got a ground, store, ground floor, um, no step entry, long hallway, private bath, private suite, big enough to have a sort of a sitting area and a bedroom area. It's designed as an accessory dwelling that was snuck in is, a, is sort of the right word by the wife and the architect uh, under the guise of it being an office for the husband who's a big job. You know, so the reality is it's an accessory dwelling inserted into a house that's just ready to be converted. This is an 18, uh, about a hundred and some, over a hundred year old Victorian in uh, West Oakland near the uh, BART station, train station. It was a rental that was really just kind of abused and really neglected. Um, we lifted it, added this garage, and then added an ADU on the ground floor and then rebuilt the rest of the house. Uh, this is your classic, you know, addition. I kind of lump additions and accessory dwellings together because from an architecture and construction perspective, there's similar amount of work um, and a similar process. Uh, but this was a single car garage that was demolished or technically remodeled because we saved a few pieces of wood. Um, and I'm guessing 80, 90% of you know what I mean. Uh, if not all. The, uh, it's about 300 square foot footprint with another 100 square feet upstairs um, for a guidance counselor who built it for herself to move into to lure her children back, her daughter, son-in-law, and when we built it was one grandkid on the way. I haven't talked to her in several years, but I looked up, she rents out an Airbnb while she's waiting for the daughter to come back. And I noticed her Airbnb profile went from one grandkid to two in her, with her holding them. So that's like her plan. And she's, frankly, she's paying the bills and paying off the, the cost of it in a couple of years while she's waiting for them to come back. Vacation homes, you know, of course, if you're lucky, you can do this. This was a Jackson Hole uh, ski house. It has this sort of semi-efficient semi design. You can tell it's not very large. Behind it, I, I didn't get the best photo here, but there's a barn with an in-law unit in it uh, and an office. So it's really multi-purpose, multi-use. Um, the fifth project type that we always sort of speak to is a lot of times is what stuff will morph into. This is a, another 100 plus year old house that needed like just classic improvements, 50 years of deferred maintenance. 
and the new owners needed to, you know, like wanted to freshen up the kitchen and add a, a au pair suite and do some other small stuff like that. Uh, small being $100,000 before you know it when you're, you know, seismic, it's, Bert, it's California, so it's seismic retrofit, new plumbing, new electrical, all that stuff. And then they put in probably $30,000 worth of fancy stuff that you see, and they did another $70,000 in deferred maintenance catch up. Um, the sort of sixth way that I view projects, are, this is a multifamily. Uh, it's about, I think it's eight units here and eight units here, co-owned by two brothers. One of them was a kicker for the 49ers, who interestingly owns a, uh, a public REIT, basically, that buys, uh, bought, you know, the all the foreclosed homes eight, 10 years ago, or seven, eight years ago, um, and then just rented them out and then rolled it up and sold it. But when it came time for them to actually add a unit, they wanted to convert, they wanted to add units on the lower floor on both sides. And this is one where they said, all right, we want a backyard, we want like an in-law unit, ADU. They're not allowed, so what we're doing is we're fitting in a couple of bedrooms on both floors, designed to have living rooms, bedrooms, kitchen area, bathroom, and to be converted when the laws catch up. Until then, there's gonna be a staircase to the upstairs, and they're converting, adding bedrooms to the first floor units. Um, the thing I like about this is, even a CEO of a company that owns thousands and thousands of homes and has crews of remodelers, when it comes time to do an ADU or a complicated project like this, they came to us because they wanted an architect who's dealt with these kind of buildings in this specific city to get through the design and permitting and do what's right. Um, so, talking about scale a bit, I'll run through a couple of slides about how we approach basically the entire design build process. Uh, so for New Avenue, we start with good people first, qualified architects, qualified contractors who know how to run um, the design process, the building process, uh, the permitting process, of course, is part of that. Then we try to add as much transparency as we can, and we do that by sharing data around costs and schedules of completed projects. And something we do that's unique is we manage all of the payments on a software platform that go from the very first meeting through the finish of the construction, so we know what's paid for design, subconsultants and engineers, surveys, um, you know, permits, and then all the construction. So we say this is when the, a lot of people paid them, made their first payment, this is when they made their last payment, this is where all the money went in between. It's what you should plan on. Like don't go for wishful thinking of, of you know, beating the last one by X percent. Um, so a lot of what we do at New Avenue is um, we focus on improving the experience of everybody involved, the owner, the architect, and the contractor. Uh, and we do that by getting them on the same page and getting them to work together. Uh, and then we do that with our, with our platform, which primarily focuses on communication. Uh, communication begins with you know, good education, setting good expectations, and then guiding people through the whole process, and I'll show a bit of how that works. Um, for scale, it's really the education, um, which I mentioned the transparent costs and schedules to set expectations, which gets people going in the same direction and in agreement. We automate onboarding. I loved the last presentation I went to, the design one with the architects. Uh, we ask people, we've, we've tested through all of our projects, where are their failure points during the design or during the permitting or during construction? And then we try to ask questions up front that say, hey, homeowner, like we've had projects where before we did this years ago, we had one where a um, son-in-law was designing an accessory dwelling unit. Uh, the father-in-law was very grateful that his son-in-law was building it for him, didn't want to sort of insert too much of his own opinion. They designed an entire beautiful two-story unit and had a nice garage and everything, and storage and stuff on the ground floor, beautiful unit upstairs. And then when they got all the way to building permits, the wife, actual daughter of the, of the sort of future you know, father-in-law, noticed that the dad couldn't get up the front steps to the stoop of their house. And they said, you know, we gotta revisit this design. design. I mean, it, at the end of the day, it was probably, I hate to admit it, but probably 10,000 bucks worth of effort. It was in Santa Cruz. They had to read it, they basically sliced it in half, made it single story, read it the whole thing. So now one of the 32 questions are, are, is, are there any mobility issues, you know, anything like that. So, and that's, you know, and then a bunch of other questions, we, we, answer, we ask those, we get the answers, we record it online, and then we share it with the architect so the architect can read it and think about it. We share it with the contractor likewise so they can read it and think about it. And then everyone has that stuff in their head for a week or so or more before they go and meet with the owner. Two minutes, okay. Um, so, cost data gives people confidence. We manage the payments. Um, start to finish, as I mentioned. So what we can standardize, this is the way we view our role in the world. Local architects are critical, local contractors are critical, 
we do not want to interfere with the creative process of doing that or the on-site management process of doing that. But what we can standardize are the things that nobody wants to do. Educate the owner, spends lots of time talking about how much stuff costs, how long it takes, all that, all that stuff. Proposals, bids, um, construction agreements, design agreements, uh, and invoices. We standardize all that and just have a template that we just provide via our site. Um, an example of how we educate people, and I won't run you through all of this, but every time a homeowner reaches out to us, we say, there's five pro phases in every project. Like architects and contractors don't typically have that discussion. Owners don't typically have any exposure to that. But we say, program development, you're gonna figure out what you wanna do, how, how, much, you know, how long it might take, you know, what your budget is, that kind of stuff. Schematic design, that's when you figure out your design, and your, get your, your planning permits typically, at least in most of our, the jurisdictions where we've worked. Uh, design development, that's picking all the stuff you see. Construction documents, uh, engineering building permits, and then bids and construction. So we just say, hey owners, this is how it's gonna work. It's probably gonna take 18 months. That's our average, actually. Um, this is the most uh, important thing I'll show you for what we do in our process. Basically, Communication 101, it's, there's not just education of like telling homeowners how much it might cost and how long it might take. There's also, once you get the architect or contractor on site, we've mapped across all of our projects what people have paid for on projects from basically $100,000 up to about three million. And it's really about 200 things that people pay for. Um, and we break them all down in line items, which obviously you can't read, but the key is 50 of them go towards design and permitting, 150 of them go towards construction. And then we say, hey, architect, just type in, choose the ones, and usually the architect chooses about 25 of the 50. Likewise, the contractor usually chooses 50 or 70 of the, the remaining, about half. Uh, and they say, this is what I think, this is my estimate for, you know, permit research, schematic design version one, version two, permitting, et cetera, et cetera. And then when we invoice, we say, this is what we said it was gonna be, this is what we're billing you, if it's off, we can explain why, and we can stay on the same page. So we do that, um, how much are we over, one minute? Um, so ADU Task Force 360, we talked, the big sessions talked a lot about this. There's a group in Berkeley that I joined, and this is a little bit of a sort of a side, but, one Berkeley City Council person wanted to be the housing person in the city and get credit for creating accessory dwellings. He called up a couple of us, a realtor, an architect, a contractor, me, um, a mortgage specialist. We literally just emailed our, our list and then we put on sessions. We met a couple of times on Sunday afternoons. We did panels in a senior center. 200 people show up, it's a packed audience, and we just do panels, like if you went to the last design session or something like this, and we just talk for 20, 30 minutes and then take questions for 45 minutes. And it's amazing, a ton of clients come out of it, awareness goes up, it's really easy. If you wanna do it, like you send an email, invite people to a senior center. I've got a free project, I was, I'm not gonna dig into it much at all, but this is the kind of data we share with homeowners. We actually usually show the more detailed data, but we say here's what the five phases cost, this is what you might wanna spend for design, this is what your neighbors did. And I could speak to some of these permits, but we give people the insights in how a garage conversion, can add up to $174,000, which is shocking to many people. If you've been through it, you might know where all that money goes. We talk about additions and how you can do two stories to get your cost down for, to 300 per square foot. Uh, and then we talk about what, when you live in a $2 million home and you say, I'm gonna retire to this jewel box, which this is only 85% done, it doesn't quite pop. But um, this is an owner who said, I want everything. I want you know the radiant floor heats, lots of custom mill work, lots of you know, the gas fire place and on and on the tile and all that. So we go through how this stuff adds up. That's a lot of the data that we share. We think it's basically sharing data and having good architects and contractors. I mean, this is my, my big thing. If you want, if you're a city planner or involved in, in government in some way, we'd love to talk about, the group that I work with, the 360 group, would love to talk about how we um, basically got a little bit more momentum going in Berkeley with those sessions. They're pretty easy to set up. Then architects and contractors, I mean, our role is to try to partner with architects and contractors. We don't deal directly with the clients in regards to design or construction because we feel that should be a very personal relationship between owner and designer or owner and contractor. So that's our thing. So we have uh, just under 15 minutes for some questions, and I'm going to throw out the first one just because I can do that. <laughs> and I'm, uh, my question is about this issue of cust customization. 
Um, I, I kind of came to this session thinking we were going to hear all these secrets about how to make things more affordable and, you know, how to kind of make, make construction processes more efficient and create some affordability. But, uh, I mean, I think that the, the customization that people are looking for have something to do with the markets that you're working in. I mean, I don't even think I heard right. Did you say that the median home price in Vancouver is two million? <laughs> no, it's over two million. Over two million. Thank you for thank you, you for just, clarifying. You just stopped at the first digit. I mean, you know. of course they're going to want a custom unit because they can afford that, right? I mean, it's you know okay, but I I I'm going to jump because it's a good point, and I think um, we'll all have some insights on that. I mean, there's always a scale and there's always affordability. I mean, a lot of the financing that happens with the ADUs in Vancouver tend to be uh, twofold. One, most happen through we have a quite a robust. Um, uh, um, Sorry, um, not tr you call them trust down here, but they're for us. They're like a kind of, you know like a bank and a, a credit union. Thank you very much. And uh, and there are credit unions uh, count income that can be generated as part. Right. Mm -hmm. Most people are they don't work. Well, it's really difficult for a stress test, but a lot of people are sitting on land. Uh, and again, um, focusing on our cohort, um, there's a little disproportionate and not to command the mic too much, about 75% of the ADUs that are built in Vancouver are part of new development. What we do is specifically infills, and we have about 20% of that market, and about 85% of our clients tend to be, have a familial relationship with the current property owner. So, um, but with regards to affordability, and I mean, I'm going to take a little segue here. One thing that we discovered is that, and I think you're, we were talking in, a, in an earlier session as well, is that there's a lot of pressures around improving building envelope as a way to minimize uh, carbon footprint. But yet the ADU and these smaller buildings actually function on a different capacity. So one thing that we are currently doing with the city, and it's a study we started working with some energy specialists, we were able to redesign and duplicate laneway homes to three that we've already built and we were able to deliver them for less than, for more than 30% less money if we abandoned the code issues around energy performance and this looked at carbon footprint both in manufacturing and operations. Mm -hmm. So there are routes forward, but it takes that kind of lateral thinking and I think the ADU is about that because it's all about what do we need, how do we address it, and standing back from current practices and looking at new practices that get to, the, get to our aspirational goals in a different way. Yeah, either you want to address that a little bit? Was the question you were expecting it to be about costs going down? Well, I guess I, I I mean, I was thinking, you know, scaling up, how do we, how do we solve so, kind of this issue, I'll, need for a larger I'll scale? Say, I'll okay. say, my conclusion on scales, so I started New Avenue, I was going to do, we were going to finance some, they were going to be prefab, and they were going to be backyard cottages. We dropped the financing of the prefab immediately, because we, and we've done a couple of prefab cottages, like panel, what, panelized walls, modular units, all that. Frankly, custom design and custom construction, when managed well, is you can get total flexibility and it's less expensive consistently. There might be some prefab system invented in the future that will change that, but I've never seen it and I've seen the opposite many times. So we're focused on, if you want to scale, you work with the skills that the local architects have and the local contractors have. Okay. Yeah, um, I'm kind of also driven by the market, but we built over the last couple of years, uh, cost-wise. Um, garage conversions for rentals for the lowest is probably about $75,000. Up to, the maximum we can build here is 800 square feet, and we're over 200,000 on several of them now. But it's driven by the market and by the customer. Um, I can build less expensive, I don't want to say cheaper, <laughs> um, products but the customer's driving what they want in them. So I did come up with, Portland relaxed or modified the zoning code to allow for some small ADUs, one story ADUs to be built uh, closer to property lines and less restrictive to having to match the house and so forth. And so I came up with four little prototype pre-designs for those and I figured I'm trying to balance at building them, pricing them as economically as I can but also not bare bones finishes, still have some slab countertops and uh, things like that, you know, little bells and whistles inside, but uh, I've tried to address that and it's just starting to gain some, some interest right now, so. Great, okay. I'll take the uh, right there in the middle, yep. Yeah. 
Hey, well, it sounds like most of the examples you gave were infill projects. I'd be curious if um, you have experience with scaling up in terms of brand new construction, including ADUs at the time of building out of subdivisions. I, I have just a couple times uh, within the subdivision. Actually, it's back when we were doing production housing and uh, the ADUs were just, uh, the code was just changing on it. And we, we built two or three uh, East Portland uh, for, targeted for multi-generational housing. And um, so yeah, we built three or four with a uh, new house, garage, apartment type deal in the backyard. How did they sell? <clears throat> Sold well, yeah. Okay, some in the back, back there. Yep. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm also interested in this issue of scaling and affordability and interested to find out if those of you who started with some idea of kind of modular and less customized housing, more or less demand that it comes to the market. One, do you think that is largely because more affluent people tend to be early adopters, as with cars and personal computers and a lot of things, and that the market itself will move down scale over time? And B, because most ADU ordinances um, are restricted to owner occupants, and so people put their more of their heart and soul into this. And if they let landlords do this, they might be more concerned with what could I throw up that I can rent. I'll, I'll say briefly. Um, the I I think it's driven by the well. I don't. Know, I don't think early adopters have more money. I think it's at the end of the day. There's you'll hit a DIY point. Where you go, if you go to real, if where I'm from in Buffalo, New York, people will build it themselves. They'll still custom build it, and then if they can afford a contractor, then they'll they'll use a contractor, and they still want it to be custom. That's the what I've sort of realized. So there's something different about you should really we should really divorce our concept of oh my iPhone I want it, I want this it goes it's not that I want the living room with the white tile fireplace that I just saw in Jake's photo <laughs> and I want it to be custom made for me with a view of the lake where I'm going to buy my house. <laughs> Yeah, and so I, I maybe combined my answer with the question before as well, and which is that I think, you know, this is obviously this conference and these discussions are really important, but we're not going to really ever crack of nut where we're, we're forced into a box or forced into a scenario where we're not really going to be able to affect land costs generally, and we're not going to be able to affect construction costs. So the ADU is the vanguard of how we look at our single family neighborhoods and how they change. And we're generally in a 30-year building cycle where bigger is better. And as more, and I'm the head of the Builders Association in my neighborhood, <laughs> one of the board of directors. We do a great job at selling. And the bigger the house, the more money the builder makes, generally. Mm -hmm. So this is really, this, this is the litmus. This is the start of the discussion where how do we start to make more reasonable size homes? What do those homes look like? And through that process, we'll find, hopefully, a sweet spot where we hit affordability. OK. Right here. Okay. Uh, it just made me wonder, what if you if you were able to build two ADUs that were? Can you hear? Technical? Can you hear in the back? Sorry, I just want to make sure. Mm -hmm. Speak up a little bit. Right. So you know, most most zones allow one ADU per lot. If you were able to do two units at the same time, how do you think that would <coughs> cost per unit? Would it be much short per unit? There'd be a there'd be a little bit of savings to scale there, but a lot of it is just cost per piece, basically, uh, it's per square foot, per, per uh, uh, component. So um, from the builder standpoint, there's less overhead to do something like that, but the actual hard cost is not going to vary a whole lot, as far as I know. I would, I would say, you know, the, the idea of a kind of uh, a party wall, really where, where that would really work is if you know again i'm going to use our examples where we have lanes in our city it's a grid pattern if we could do a row house the length of the lane we could probably deliver a passive row house at less at a lower cost point than it's you know if we looked at the then probably probably by a significant margin than what a standalone unit would be on the same land thanks for that how about over on that side? I don't know anyone has row houses in the lanes yet. I got a question for Jake. If I'm reading your numbers right, you said the past 36 months you had you're averaging about 50 lane houses a year. I was wondering if what your pipeline was 
when you abandon the pre-designed route to go towards your customer? What do you yeah. cap out at? Well, it was about 50% in, in the last third of our time. So in the last four years, about 50 homes. But um, we, we abandoned the prefab as, as a closed wall system. We were probably maybe doing um, 18 homes a year or something like that. Uh, this wasn't enough, but the thing is, you could quadruple that number, and you'd probably still be pressed to make a production facility a viable financial entity. Thank you. Okay, I uh, Just almost segueing from that question or what your comments. Uh, so, Kevin and Jake, you both had experience with prefab, and then letting the you know the local guys do the custom work. What would you say were the, the factors that contributed to the prefabs that, that made costs higher? Um, well, it's, it's certainly all the prefab companies that, are, especially that I've seen in the EDU space, are, are still doing one-offs. So the number one thing, and that's not the prefab factory's fault; it's the consumer's fault. And it's once you do like one slight tiny bit of customization, like make this bay window four feet wide instead of three feet wide. You're like, you're re-engineering, you're customizing everything, or switch the tile. The designer miscounts the tile, you, you're missing an edge, whatever. It's like you're basically going through the entire custom design process. So all the efficiencies you hope for disappear. That's it. <laughs> and and I, I would just say, Stan, to that, uh, we, we, we abandoned a closed wall system, but we kept a panelized facility. We just partnered with another person. So we still do our panels and our wood uh, cassettes and roof cassettes in a factory, and we assemble a house in about a week. Like in the sense of this is structure, right? But not everything else has to be done on site because we couldn't find any efficiencies to do it otherwise. Is that panelized system, do you use that in most of your houses? We, uh, exclusively. All exclusively, yeah. okay. Okay, I'm going to take one more question because we got to go and they're going to kill me. Right there. Uh, so we have a lot of data on folks who have at least made it as far enough into the building process to have taken out some sort of permit. That's what most of the PSU data is based on. But you all, I presumably dealt with folks even earlier in the process, maybe just made a casual inquiry or just sort of felt it out and abandoned it for whatever reason very early on. I just wanted to see among that group what the most common reasons for early abandonment of a, a new project are. Hmm. Uh, I would say in our case it tends to be eligibility. So we have maybe 50,000 building sites in Vancouver, and I would say the most attrition we have is either we're too high at the end of the market, so it's price, so it's not, they're not naming up, abandoning the project altogether, and then the next contributing factor would just be their, the specifics of their lot make them ineligible. I think, it's, I think it's fear. Fear of being overwhelmed and losing, like that. someone mentioned something about a two year, not looking for a two year hobby that's gonna take up all their time. I think it's that, and writing, Ten thousand, fifty thousand dollar checks once a month for many, many months in a row. <laughs> Not yet. It's terrifying. Yeah, I think it's a great question. Uh, I had put a whole lot of thought to it, but uh, thinking back, uh, the number of inquiries, just <coughs> basic inquiries that I get, uh, probably turn into maybe ten percent of bills. Uh, so they might go to somebody else or whatever. I, so I, I, it's really hard to track. But there is a fear factor. I, I get customers that get cold feet and then call me back two years later, and they're ready to go then. They've thought through it and so forth. And then, of course, budget. I mean, it's always uh, a stumbling block. In the past, financing has been more of a stumbling block. It's getting better and better. It's a project. All right, thank you so much, everybody.